Assalamualaikum everyone. Um, sorry for the uh, slight delay, some technical issues. First time I've ever tried out this technology. So um, we're here today with um, Sheikh Umar from uh, America and uh, Brother Sharif from UK, uh, Manchester in UK. And we are here to um, have a dialogue on the recent conversion or reinstatement of Hagia Sophia as a masjid uh, after it had been for, uh, a museum for a prolonged period of time since uh, the time Atatürk came into power. And I believe yesterday was the first uh, Juma that took place after about 86 years. So previously Hagia Sophia was a, a significant cathedral for the Orthodox Christian community. And it was such for I think approximately about a thousand years. The Ottoman Empire then uh, through conquest, gain victory over the land and um, and converted it to a masjid, and it stayed as a masjid for 500 years. Uh, and then when the Khilafah fell and Ataturk came into power, it was removed from the status of a masjid and made into a museum. So the discussion we have today is what is the Islamic outlook on this? Is it something that was permissible is with Islam? What are the political, social influences of uh, of this decision? And we have Sheikh Umar, who is of the position um, that it's a wrong thing to do. It's something that's not permitted in Islam. And it's something that would not, it's not only legally wrong in terms of from a fiqh perspective, but it will have a negative political and social influence. And on the opposite pers perspective of this, we have uh, Brother Sharif. So we'll start off this discussion by both parties uh, having a 10 minute or a maximum of 10 minute introduction in, on their position on the issue. And then we'll take this in the terms of a friendly uh, dialogue where questions and viewpoints will be exchanged between both parties. And I will interject with certain questions. Um, and I'd just like to start by apologizing to anyone who's watching or, or the speakers if they get offended by any questions I pose. I'm just here to weed out any points and, and get to the meat of the matter. So without any delay, I would ask uh, Sharif to start off with his uh, introduction into the topic. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad, amma ba'd. Um, Jazakallah khair for inviting me on, uh, Jazakallah khair for uh, Sheikh Umar and Ma'roof uh, for organizing this discussion. Um, I've written something down and the reason why I wrote it down is because I know I have a problem keeping to 10 minutes. So I'm going to try my best as possible to address some of the points uh, as quickly and as concisely as possible, inshallah. So Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. There are many angles and points to the discussion on Hagia Sophia and its reversion back to a mosque. For example, was Hagia Sophia simply a church? Is it allowed to convert churches into mosques? Are the Orthodox Christians potential allies for Muslims? And will this isolate Muslims for, from this potential ally in the future? Should Hagia Sophia have remained as a museum? Will this give precedence for the Zionists to convert Masjid al-Aqsa into a synagogue. Why is there such criticisms arising from the West and also from some Muslims? All of these and many more questions are valid questions to ask and discuss. However, before we delve into these questions, we need to understand certain premises for this discussion. Firstly, we should acknowledge as Muslims that Islam is the true and only deen from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us to follow today. That the creator of this world and the entire universe expects all of mankind now to follow the last message given to the final prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that our responsibility is to take this message and its implementation to the whole of mankind. That's the first point. Secondly, we need to avoid superimposing our 21st century views onto the past. In particular, how many how many of us today view religion and its relation to politics? As we know, religion is perceived as a so largely secular endeavor in the West. That is to say, there's a clear detachment of religion with politics. Obviously, we understand Islam is not a secular religion, 
but Christianity has now accepted its role within the private sphere of human lives and its detachment with a wider public role. But this wasn't the case before the European Enlightenment. Christianity was the religio-cultural basis of the political institutions of the state and various empires. So we ca cannot view Christianity and even the role of churches detached from the pre-secular world they inhabited. So after making these premises explicit as the basis of this discussion, we can proceed maybe to approach some of the, the context and the questions that we asked at the beginning. Firstly, was Hagia Sophia simply a church? As I mentioned, churches were not as we see them today, which are largely insignificant in the West, certainly in the public role. And although different churches held different influence within the political establishment in pre-modern, pre-secular times, Hagia Sophia was unique amongst the churches. And in order to understand this, we need to have some basic history of the Hagia Sophia. So prior to any church established on the current grounds of Hagia Sophia, it was a temple to the Greco-Roman gods. After the Christian conversion of the Roman Empire and the moving of the capital city from Rome to Constantinople under the Roman Emperor Constantine I, his son Constantius the, built the first church as a basilica over the Greco-Roman temple next to the original plans of the Emperor's palace. Then in 404, Christian era, it was burnt down through various revolts that sought to target a prominent seat of the emperor's power. It was then subsequently rebuilt by Emperor Theodosius II in 414 CE. However, a century later, it was burnt down, again targeted by protesters in what was known as the Nica Revolution against Justinian I. Justinian I, the emperor, survived the revolt and later rebuilt the entire church and called it Hagia Sophia. The church was considered an imperial church. As we can see, various revolts target this church in particular, not because it was just a church, but rather it was a symbol of the emperor's political power. In fact, major positions on Christianity was debated and decided upon in the Hagia Sophia, including the excommunication of the Western Christian tradition, as we call the Catholics of today. And this took place in the 11th century. And this was also known as the Great Schism, which effectively politically separated the Western from the Eastern for, uh, part of the Roman Empire, with the West, Western Roman Empire now headed by the Bishop of Rome, also known as the Pope. Furthermore, every emperor had to be crowned in the uh, Hagia Sophia to legitimize their rule. Thus, even during periods of rebellions and the killings of various emperors, the subsequent usurper emperor would seek to consecrate their power through not only control, but also the coronation in the Hagia Sophia. As can be seen, Hagia Sophia was not simply a church. Rather, it had social political importance for the Roman Empire, what we sometimes call today the Byzantine Empire. And unlike the Western Roman Empire, the head of the church of the Eastern Roman Empire was the emperor himself. In fact, when the Catholics took control of Constantinople, one of the first acts uh, to do was to convert Hagia Sophia into a Catholic church, which it maintained from around about 1204 to 1260, until the Roman Empire or the Eastern Roman Empire defeated and retook the city. Therefore, Hagia Sophia was more akin to the White House in America or the Houses of Parliament in Britain or the Kremlin of Russia. In this context, we can see that after the conquest of the Byzantine or Eastern Roman Empire, by Sultan Muhammad al fati that not only did this mean the end of the Roman Empire, but that to make Constantinople the capital city of the Ottomans, and thus a Muslim city within Darul Islam, then those social political buildings and institutions needed to be accommodated within the Muslim polity. So it's inevitable that for any conquering force to maintain its control over a land, they needed to take control over significant social political institutions and bring them in line with the new status quo. This would be analogous to how the Allied forces took control of the Reichstag after the defeat of Nazi Germany. And even after the restoration of the Reichstag in the 1960s, for it was maintained for historical importance, many of the statues and murals which depicted Nazi-esque cultural influence were removed from the Reichstag building and destroyed. Would we envisage 
that after defeating the Nazis, the Allied forces allowed Nazis to main maintain control over the cultural institutions and buildings? No, obviously not. So in similar vein, Sultan Muhammad al-Fatih took control over the Hagia Sophia. And although there are many reports and historians who claim it was purchased by Muhammad al-Fatih, the fact remains that the Islamic fiqh permitted him to take this building. As Ibn al-Qayyim al, -Qayyum al Allah, mentioned in his work, Al-Ahkam al, uh, al ahl al who states, those lands forcefully taken, deciding what to do with the churches is looked at from the, uh, from the maslaha of the Muslims, from the point of view of the benefit of the Muslims. So maybe later on we can go into a more detailed discussion on the fiqh of the conversion of places of worship into mosques. However, the very least, there is legitimate difference of opinion. And as can be clearly seen, it was definitely essential to maintain power and end the Roman Empire in order to take control over the Hagia Sophia, to take control over the city, but to allow the important social, religious, political institution and imperial church of the Roman Empire, I Hagia Sophia, to remain with the Orthodox Christian population in a pre-secular world would inevitably place the city in constant danger of reversion and reigniting aspirations of the re-establishment of the Roman Empire. As we know, the Hagia Sophia for almost half a millennium remained a mosque where the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were recited, where the building was reinforced and maintained by the Muslims up until 1934 when Mustafa Kemal sought to change its status into a museum. In doing so, Amongst other major reforms, he was trying to undertake a symbolic act to render Islam secular and prevent its re-emergence as a social political justification for a future Khilafah state, effectively rendering Islam as a historical artifact that is viewed in museums. The current outcry that we've seen in the West in the reversion back into a mosque is therefore seen as a reversal, as, as a reversal of the symbolic reversal of the secular foundations of Mustafa Kemal. Their concern, therefore, has little to do with the original status of Hagia Sophia, which, as we know, was originally a pagan temple. So it has little significance about whether it should be returned back to a church or Orthodox Christianity, but rather a concern over the symbolic reassertion of the Islamic identity of the state and the growing sentiments to see Islam take a major or a bigger role within society. Much can be said, and hopefully, inshallah, we'll get more into this discussion with the discussion at hand. But whether we view this pure, purely from a, a social political phenomena uh, and the legitimate opinion within the Islamic fiqh, we can see that not only the conversion of Hagia Sophia into a mosque was legitimate, and we should also celebrate, even though this is symbolic, or largely symbolic, that now the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are being praised again in the Hagia Sophia. Jazakallah khair. Thank you, Brother Sharif, for your opening remarks. Uh, I'll now pass it over to Sheikh Omar with his opening statement. Ah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Huwa al-lazhi arsala rasoolahu bil huda wa deen al-haq liyudhirahu ala al-deen kulli wa law kariha al-mushrikun. Rabbi shahli sadri wa yasilli amri wa ahlu al-uqdata min lisani yafkahu qawli amin ya Rabbi. Please let me know when my 10 minutes are over, maybe. There's no doubt that establishing the deen, establishing the khilafah, establishing the rules of Allah on earth is an obligation upon all of us. The question, however, that's essential, very, very, there's some very key points that need to be discussed. Number one, <clears throat> would an Islamic state, would an Islamic state be an expansionist state? Meaning, would when we have power, would we use our military to go around the world and, and force our hegemony on the world? Is this what the Prophet did, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? This is a very important question because I think it is a very misunderstood question. How do Muslims justify, for example, the Battle of Tabuk? Because there is a difference between what happened in Arabia and then the internationalization of Islam started with the Battle of Moth and then uh, the book after that, the Prophet started these wars against the Byzantine Empire. And, you know, Orientalists uh, like Louis Bernard have talked about, you know, Islam is an expansionist state, that it wants to force itself. And so how do we understand all this? I think this is something that really needs to be understood in its proper context so that we can have the discussion of 
how the Islamic State can expand, what are the per perimeters in which it expands, what are the rules in which it allows itself to expand, why did the Prophet choose the Byzantine Empire, and then after that, Amr bin As chose, for example, Egypt. Why not Abyssinia, for example? Why not where, uh, you know, uh, some of the other places, which I will come to in a second. The first thing that I want to clear is this. There is a sunnah of Allah in the Quran. And that is that when a prophet is sent somewhere, there is a rule of Allah, ana wa rusuli, me and my messenger have to prevail. When a message is sent somewhere and the people reject a prophet and he is either a Rasul of Allah or a Nabi of Allah in that area and the only one in that area, then Allah decimates that place if they reject his call. For example, Nuh, for example, Lut, so this was the sunnah of Allah, and if you notice the tartib of the Qur'an, the chronology of the Qur'an, right? Uh, the first four surahs from Sutul Baqarah to Sutul Ma'idah give us the blueprint of the Ummah. Then the next four surahs, uh, that is Sutul Anam, Sutul Araf, Sutul Anfal, and Sutul Tawbah. They, the first two surahs after that tell us about this sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that when Allah sends a messenger, you have to believe or you have to face the consequences. And that's going to come in one of the three ways. Either they have to believe or Allah eradicates them from the world or Allah punishes or something in the middle, which is Allah will uh, let the believers take over and then they believe. Like in the case of the Prophet, for example, they believed. In the case of Musa, والسلام, they believed. But in the case of Lut, والسلام, they didn't believe. In the case of Salih, when they see the camel coming out of the mountains, they didn't believe. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, in the case of uh, the uh, I forget right now the name of the Prophet, uh, but you know what I'm saying. So there's the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he sends a Prophet, you have to accept. In this case of the Prophet, for example, when the Prophet said, says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I have been commanded to fight with the people hatta yaqulu la ilaha illallah, until they say la ilaha illallah. This is specific to his saying in Egypt, I have come to you specifically meaning the Arabs, especially the Quraysh, have come to you specifically because there will be a judgment of Allah on you because a messenger has been sent and a messenger has to prevail. This is the sunnah of Allah. Isa والسلام, has to come back in order to make the people who rejected him face judgment. This is one of the reasons. In the same way, for example, uh, Yunus والسلام, he left his place of da'wah when the punishment of Allah was coming, and we know the event of the boat, or the, when he was in the whale, and he came back, but that punishment was averted because the messenger of Allah was not there to witness the punishment as it was coming. And they did tawbah, and Allah accepted their tawbah, and the Prophet came back to them. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is, Arabia, this is why the Prophet said that there will be no qiblatains, no two qiblas in Arabia, Jazirat al-Arab. This is why the Prophet said وسلم, that no shirk and mushrikeen will be allowed in the Arabs, amongst the Arabs, meaning Jazirat al-Arab, this place. So when the Quran says, you know, you have four months, when the Prophet took over the conquest of Mecca, he said, you have four months, four months, arbata ashur, you have four months to accept Islam or die. Or the other option was to leave. That was specific to the Prophet وسلم, specific to Arabia. Now, now that I've clarified that, you can ask me any questions later on. This is not me saying this. I mean, this is Dr. Isra Ahmed has talked about this in detail. Mona Farahi has talked about this in detail. Mona Muhammad Shafi has like over 20 pages on this issue that when a messenger is sent, they have to believe in him or they are eradicated from the face of the earth. So this was a special case you can say in the case of the Prophet where everyone in total had to accept the deen of Allah subhanahu wa had to accept uh, Islam, okay? Uh, Mawlana Taqi Usmani also in his recent tafsir that he has, it's also in English, available in English, he mentions this in Sutta Tawbah, okay? This is one of the reasons Sutta Tawbah doesn't have Bismillah because it was the judgment of God coming to a people that had a Prophet himself uh, do the da'wah and they had to accept the call. They had no choice. And if, if we're going to apply the role, the, these ayat generally upon the whole world, then you have to go there and not say we gave you jizya uh, or give us jizya. Then we have to say, okay, you have four months to accept Islam. Otherwise, we're going to fight you, just like the Quran then mentions. But this is not the case. Now, 
how do we then understand the Byzantine Empire and the other places where Muslims expanded themselves? Now, this is also a very important topic. Towards the end of Surah Tawbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us an ayah that is uh, contested. If this is a, talking about the Arabs or it's talking about the non-Arabs. But Allah, basically, the idea is that the Prophet sallallahu had sent his ambassadors. They had killed the ambassador, the Ghassan tribe, had killed the ambassadors of the Prophet sallallahu and because you kill an ambassador, that is a call to war. Just like what happened to Uthman, in the case of Uthman, one in the case of Hudaybiyah. You kill an ambassador, then you got, uh, you got a problem, meaning you have basically declared war. So this was one reason. The other reason was Jerusalem was promised to the Muslims, which we can talk about. It was the promised land. Is my time up? No, you've got two more minutes. Okay, good. Alhamdulillah. So the expansion of Islam happened in areas starting based upon what the Quran said. And I'll come to how this does, this contradicts what we did in, the Ottomans did in, in, in the case of Hagia Sophia. In the case when the Sahaba were there, they were fighting and they were fighting for what can be called a just war. The people in Syria, the people in Egypt, they were being overtaxed. In fact, the, the local population, or, uh, Khalid bin Walid didn't take ladders with him to climb these forts that, that he was fighting in, Sham, in, in the conquests. The local monasteries were giving Khalid bin Walid the ladders that you take these ladders from us and you go ahead and fight. The point I'm trying to make is these people were overtaxed. They didn't like the Byzantine. They fell into that category that, you know, where Allah says, What is wrong with you? Don't fight in the path of Allah. When there are women and children and men crying for help, that Allah help us take us out of this oppressed system. And so Islam attacked those areas and those countries and those people that were ruling in areas that were oppressive. Islam didn't go, for example, to Abyssinia. That place where the Prophet himself sent his own daughter for refuge. Till today, Muslims in Ethiopia, for example, in the, the place of the first hijra, Muslims and Christians have a very good relationship. The Orthodox Church of the Ethiopians, you know what it's called? It's called the, the, the Orthodox Church of Tawheed. That's what it's called. It's called the Orthodox Church of Tawheed. The point is not all non-Muslims are equal, according to the Sharia. The, the, the people that had the highest you can say price to pay were the Arabs who rejected the Prophet ﷺ. Then after that, it's based upon the basically the 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 the, the structure or the asuls fixed in the Quran after that. And one of the primary ones is if they are, if you have the strength to bring and there's another uh, very important thing that has to do with the timing issue. But let me first go to Hagia Sophia. Your, your introductory time is okay. It's coming right. now. That's okay. So, okay, uh, Jazakallah khair for both of you for your opening remarks. Uh, I'm just going to start off the discussion by asking uh, each one of you some uh, some questions and seeing where the discussion leads. Now, Sheikh Umar, um, you, you have a bit of a predicament with the position that you hold, which is the vast majority of scholars, Sheikh, students of knowledge, duats, be that people on the member or on social media, they're rejoicing with the reinstatement of Hagia Sophia as a masjid. And they're all happy with this and they see this as a positive thing. And they see the initial conquest of uh, Hagia Sophia and that being converted into a masjid to be a positive thing. So this is globally from east to the west. So if we look at Dr. Sarah Emma's Institute with Tanzim and Spam, where I believe he studied in Pakistan, or be mainstream scholars in your country like Dr. Yasser Khadi, they all uh, see this as a positive, positive move. And on the other side, there's only a couple of people or a handful of people who uh, see this to be a negative move or a move that's against Islam. And they're kind of marginalized as people being like the conspiracy theorists such as yourself, Sheikh Imran Hussein and so forth, who are shedding tears of something which they believe should be a rejoiceful moment. Do you believe that the vast majority of these scholars or are incorrect in their understanding and it's only people on your boat that that have understood this situation correctly it's a very good question um i guess time will tell um i'm not necessarily shedding tree tears i mean for me it's happened right it's like what happened in in pakistan first it was only india there was no pakistan one of the great scholars of islam was against it 
once Pakistan was made, he said, well, now that it's made, you know, it's it's over, right? I mean, now you have to move on. So in that sense, uh, a part of me is like, you know, okay, well, it happened. You have to move on. But we knew this would happen. If you, I mean, uh, my family knows I was saying that this would happen, this move would happen. But here's the real problem. And I don't think when I put it in this context, you know, uh, Ubaidullah Sindhi, rahmatullah alayhi, uh, one of the great scholars of Islam, who was try, who was part of the Khilafah movement when the Khilafah fell, he had it was called the Rumali movement. Uh, Mona Mahmoud al Hassan, rahmatullah alayhi, and some of his students, they were trying to revive the Khilafah. Right? He is one of the few people that during the Bolshevik Revolution went to meet uh, Lenin. He, he tried to meet Lenin but couldn't meet Lenin. He met um, t- uh, t- uh, Trotsky. And tried to give him the Islamic uh, model, you know, that this is how the Islamic economic, social, political model is. And Trotsky said, well, do you have a place in the world where this model exists? And uh, Ubedullah Sindhi says, I couldn't look him in the eye after that. My point being, this person, right, he says that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to punish a people, he takes away their political insight. Having said that, uh, if the issue is that we're happy over what we're happy that secularism lost and islam won because we converted a masjid because you're going to keep the same riba you're going to keep the same alcohol you're going to keep the same turkish clubs you're going to do the same same thing that is going on but because this one masjid that you didn't really need everyone was still praying juma right but because you changed this masjid, you've you have given yourself this emotional humble jumble of emotional feeling that we brought Islam. This is this is the result of lack of political insight, not lack of religious knowledge. Because if you go, you know, if you look at it from the fiqhi perspective, you can justify it. But even that is not justifiable to me because from a fiqhi perspective, you can say Pepsi is allowed. And milk is allowed, but they're both not the same. And so just because you can argue that Pepsi is allowed, but here the case is worse. Because we have made something an issue of Islam versus secularism that is actually not the real issue of Islam versus secularism. This is one problem. The other problem that I think is that uh, is that we have over-fantasized over romanticized what this what the prophet has called you know mulkan adan kingship that will bite that these kings were not khulafa like omar and abu Bakr and uthman and ali and omar bin Abdul. they were not like the khulafa their characters were not like the khulafa muhammad fatih was offered a truce he when he was building forts on in in the in the lands of the romans they they were sending gifts to him to please don't try to he the 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 Constantine kept asking, and the Quran says that if they if they offer you peace, you come back with peace, right? And so what Muhammad Fatih wanted Constantinople at any cost, no matter what the other emperor was doing to to pacify him, he offered him peace, and and he rejected it. Then he said he offered he offered him to surrender too, but at that time it was it, it was way it was way too over. So, so my answer is, number one, it is lack of political insight from an Islamic perspective because this is not establishing Sharia. This in no way helps Islam. You know, two weeks from now, how, how does this help us? It helps Muslims maybe feel good that we got one more masjid in which the name of Allah is mentioned. Alhamdulillah, that's a good thing. But the, it does not help the cause of Islam from the perspective of establishment of the deen whatsoever. And it does not help Muslims to try to defend kings who gave themselves the title of king of Rome, the, the emperor of Rome. This was the title he gave himself. Muhammad Fatih gave himself the title of, uh, he didn't give him the title of I'm a Khalifa. He didn't give himself some Islamic title. He gave himself the title of Caesar. So why are we defending someone that, now I'll tell you why we're defending someone. We're defending someone because of the saying of the Prophet ﷺ that is misinterpreted. The Prophet said ﷺ, I'll give you the exact words of the hadith and show you that we have been misinterpreting or uh, misquoting the saying of the Prophet. 
the prophet awwalul awwalul jaysh yaghzu the first army that that fights not has victory yaghzu madinatul qaisr not qustuntunya the prophet did not say qustuntunya in any of the narrations of this hadith the first army that fights the cities of this caesar this is what the prophet said you can look it up okay uh the prophet said any any the first army that fights the cities of qaisar the cities of uh, madinatul qaisar which he was in hims or he was in jerusalem if you remember the say the very first hadith in say bukhari almost where abu sufyan is there in front of hercules this event happened in jerusalem because the hercules in the time the prophet had moved his 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 seat of power to jerusalem and it is uh, it, there's reasons for why he did that which i won't go into right now but you know when he asked abu sufyan the questions and he was asking and he had his companion sitting in the back that tell, you know he was asking you know what i'm talking about so when he did this he did the prophet did not say the first army that defeats constantinople our mindset has become that uh, that that uh, that you know oh muhammad fatih is the first one to uh, to conquer Constantinople based upon a misinterpretation of this hadith. This hadith exactly. never exists with the word Constantinople. Shaykhum, I just want to bring in Sharif in here. So, uh, Sharif, Muslims often, uh, as Shaykh Umar has uh, uh, suggested, have this Bollywood fantasy image of the Ottoman Empire, of how great they are, and uh, the reality is far from that. You know, they they had many issues with them from an Islamic perspective. So, do you believe that there is any justification in defending the Ottoman Caliphate and, and their actions, in, specifically when it comes to Hagia Sophia? Yeah, so it's an interesting question. I think, um, see, when we look at this discussion about uh, Hagia Sophia and is it permissible to convert it from a church or an imperial church, let's be very clear, yeah, a social political institution that was the basis of crowning every single Roman emperor, emperor since its move from Rome to Constantinople. Yeah. So this and its founding of Hagia Sophia. So is it allowed to do this? And I think that's really the key question here. The key question is not about were the Ottomans good or bad, yeah, or did they have some haram or some things which were incorrect and some things which were good? Because I think that confuses the discussion uh, largely in regards to this. Um, uh, this discussion. Similarly, you know, were the, the more than Khulifa after the Khulifa Rashidin? Um, you know, many scholars, yeah, you know, you know, just to quote a few of these uh, scholars here, Qadi Yad, he discusses this topic and he mentions that actually there has to be more than uh, the Khilafa Rashidah because the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, that mentioned that there'll be 12, 12 Khulifa Rashidin uh, and so that, that therefore that's more than the five. Similarly, uh, Imam al-Suyuti, he records the number of Khulifa, Rashid, uh, Khulifa from the time of the Khulifa Rashidin right to his time, which was around about the 15th, 16th century. Uh, the Shafi'i scholar, uh, Imam Saifuddin Ahmadi, he discusses uh, the discussion about was the Khilaf after 30 years? And he mentions, yes, it was. And he explains it from two perspectives. One, because the wording at Hadith about changing uh, the, you know, the, 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 the Khilaf will change to a mulk. He says this is a damir, this is a pronoun which is attached to the issue of khilafah, which means that the khilafah will still exist, but it will not be at the pristine state that it used to be. And the second argument he said, he said that's ijma of the Muslims, that appointing a khalifa is obligatory, and the Muslims had always done this. So there is a discussion about, you know, whether the, uh, you know, Ottomans were good or bad, but I don't think there's a discussion, certainly not amongst the classical ulama, about whether the Khilaf existed after the Khilaf of Rashidin, I think that's accepted. What also needs to be understood as well is that Ottomans weren't the Khilaf that joined the time of Sultan Muhammad al-Fatih. The, they took the title of Khilaf or Khalifa in 1517, uh, Sulaiman al-Qanuni. He adopted this after the defeat of the Mamluks uh, in Egypt. Uh, so, you know, we have to be clear and we have to also be clear that when it came to justification of certain rulings and certain actions by Sultan Muhammad al-Fatih, I'm talking about, obviously there were certain things which are not justifiable, but there were certain things which were justifiable, like, for example, the conversion of Hagia Sophia into a mosque. They would have the opinion of Sheikh al-Islam 
of that time in order to justify that. They would recourse to Hanifi classical textbooks like Muhammad al-Shaybani's Kitab al-Siyar or Adi Abu Yusuf's Kitab al-Kharaj yeah, or many of the other ulama within the Hanafi madhahib and also across the other uh, madhahib that permitted this in the case of a city that was taken by force or opened by force as opposed to a city which was opened by a peace treaty and which there was an agreement between the, the ruler and those people that they had uh, were seeking to uh, open and therefore implement Islam or bring into Darul Islam that they were allowed to adopt or allowed to preserve their any churches and places of worship. So we know very clearly that there is a very clear understanding that the uh, the actions of Muhammad Sultan Muhammad Al Fadi was in accordance with the fiqh opinion uh, and the established Islamic opinion that was agreed upon by many scholars uh, at that time. And okay, also, just, Sharif, can I can yeah. I just uh, following on from that point? So I think even Sheikh Omar said there is scope for him to agree that there is a fiqhi position here which justifies uh, converting Hagia Sophia to a masjid. But I just want to follow this logic. So according to this logic uh, in Islamic law, it's fair game for a state to capture and convert its enemies' places of worship to their own places of worship if it's gained through conquest. Uh, and specifically in this case, because this was more than just a religious institution, this was a religious and political institute. So following this logic, does this not give the green light for, say, Israel to convert Al-Aqsa to their temple because that was gained through conquest, conquest through the Six-Day War? Or would this not provide justification for other masjids to, to be converted, which have been in Jerusalem and surrounding areas such as Hebron, Masjid Ibrahim? Or would, you know, why do we have this kind of double standard where we cry victim when uh, things like the Barbary Masjid, you know, are, are demolished and temples put in its place or when the Zionists want to demolish our masjids and build their institutions. But we think it's okay for us to do it when we gain their places of worship or their land by force. So, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of points with regards to that uh, particular question. I think the first thing in terms of Masjid al-Aqsa, uh, Masjid al-Aqsa will not be liberated if the Muslims give Hagia Sophia or Hagia Sophia back to the Orthodox Christians. It's not going to change the situation. And Israel are not waiting for Hagia Sophia to be turned into a mosque to then say, ah, oh, there's a political precedence being taking place, so we now can go after Masjid al-Aqsa. The Zionists are not interested about international law. They've not been interested since its inception or prior to its inception, where they undertook terrorist actions against the British, who themselves had stolen the land from the Ottomani Khilafah in 1917. They weren't interested when it comes to the incursions uh, in uh, the Muslim lands, whether that's in South Lebanon or in other areas, they uh, in the Sinai, the Golan Heights. They're not interested when it came to the issue of settlements occupying West Bank and the, uh, the olive groves of the Muslims. So they're not interested in terms of, you know, looking for uh, uh, any uh, political um, justification or opinion to allow this to occur. So we have to be very clear upon that. The reason why they don't change Masjid al-Aqsa is one primary reason. And that primary reason is because they are fearful of how this will be reacted in the Muslim world and how this will galvanize the support the Muslims have you know, uh, for Masjid al-Aqsa and that they would actually start to create such a massive upheaval. Yeah? So you know, there's a famous saying that the first line of defense of Israel are the Muslim rulers yeah? or the Arab rulers. And they know very well that if such an action that they were to take place, this would create such a difficult situation for these dictatorial, secular, post-colonial regimes within the Muslim world, that the failure of them to act would result in their removal and therefore the potential re-establishment of an Islamic state, the Khilafah. And therefore what will really liberate this land will be an army like from the time of Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi rahimullah. One thing I'd like to agree with Sheikh Umar about actually, which is that I agree with Sheikh Umar about the fact that this Hagia Sophia conversion back into a mosque from a museum should not be seen as right, that's it. You know, we've, we've, we've won. You know, Islam has won now and we can go home. No, no, no. And that was not even my point. My point was that actually when we look at people's criticisms 
of Hagia Sophia. It's because they are seeing the Muslim mindset change now. Back 10 years ago, if this was to occur, there would have been a coup, a military coup, like there was against Adnan Menderes and other uh, prime ministers of Turkey, where Adnan Menderes in the 1950s was executed by the military. He was a prime minister, he was I mean, prime minister or president, who you know, was elected uh, by the popular mandate. But he was removed because he was seen as too, quote unquote, Islamic. So the fact that you're having a situation where Hagia Sophia is now changing to Islam, and rather than there's a military coup by secular political elites, you see hundreds of thousands of Muslims coming out on the street, it shows a shift in the mindset. Now, what we need to do, and I think uh, I agree with Sheikh Omar on this point, is that we need to move the discussion more and say, actually, why do you have a river banking system? Why do you have a nation state? Why do you have still ties with the state of Israel? Why do you not implement the full aspects of Islam and the Sharia within this land? Yeah. So maybe that's where the discussion. But that is why the West is concerned. They, they are concerned because, you know, uh, what this sort of symbolizes in the shift in the mindset of Muslims. Okay. So if I could bring Sheikh Omar back into this. So Sheikh Omar, for my brother's consideration. He's absolutely 100% right. It's not going to make a difference to Israel because Israel is 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 feeling, uh, you know, uh, very independent uh, nowadays, especially. Uh, the problem is, is that uh, when uh, such attempts will be done, those people that Allah told us could possibly help us, right? Uh, because when Allah says, La tajidanna, uh, you will find the most severity of, of your enmity will come from the Yehud, which is Bani Israel, the Yehud, and then the, the Mushrikeen, right? And then Allah says, you will find the Christians closest to you, okay? What, we, what shaitan is able to do through this process, what he's able to achieve is not that he's going to stop the Jewish people, but he will stop us from having that possible alliance that Allah talks about that those people, because you know, whenever there's a Muslim issue, who are pro usually when there was an Iraq issue or any other issue, who are protesting more than us, the non-Muslims, many times. So the point I'm, uh, the point here is, is that you have done away with a major allies. Now they're going to say, well, they did this to our church. Well, we're not going to care about what happens to their mosque, and this will be those people that Allah says you will find closer to yourself. It wasn't about. It's not about from the Quranic perspective, in my opinion, that it will stop the, that we would have been able to or they. I mean, of course, it gives them a justification. Well, you did that there there so we can do that here. That justification's there. It wouldn't stop them. What it what what has now happened is the is the is the possibility of Christians that would speak on our behalf and and, and Christians that would have sympathy for us. They would not have sympathy for us because they feel yet again Muslims have backstabbed them. And I, let me just uh, go, go back in history here. You see, no one in Syria where the Sahaba went, no one, none of the non-Muslims, the non-Muslims where the Sahaba went are complaining in history saying Muslims came here and did this and this to us. No one in Sham, no one in Egypt. I know the Coptic Christians, speak, but that, that has more of a political aspect than, than reality in, in a historical sense, right? No one in the places where the Sahaba went, the non-Muslims complained or have been complaining or is a complaint today that why did they come here? But this is not true with the Turkish Empire. The Turkish Empire is basically the time where the Christians were first to become Muslims, become part of the Janissary, become part of the Ottoman Empire, and they're 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 part of their uh, their their elite forces, and and this created a lot of hatred amongst those Christians that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala seems to tell us that we should actually try to have an alliance with them, just like when the Prophet sent his companions and his daughter to Najashi, okay. And just like when he wrote his treaty with the people of Najran, the Christians of Najran, when he wrote his treaty, he said, look, he said in that treaty, the Prophet said, وسلم, that the Quraysh and the, and the Yahud in Medina opposed me. They made treaties with me and they opposed me. <coughs> and he said, وسلم, but you Christians have not opposed me, but helped me. And in that treaty, the Prophet says, وسلم, that my ummah should know 
He says these words, and I can show it to you. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in this treaty, he said that, you know, there's a hadith, uh, it's easier to explain it this way, there's a hadith, the Prophet, that be good to your parents' friends, right? When your parents pass away, the way to show goodness to your parents, to do good to your parents is by being good to their friends. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, remember the good that they did to me, meaning these Christians, okay? Remember the good they did to me. Be, because they did good to me at a time where the Jews and the polytheists were being uh, were were most vicious against me. So here here now I'm saying that whether we have the political insight or not, the fact is Quran tells us to, to look for alliances. The Prophet looked for alliances all the time, and the key players for alliances for Muslims are a certain type of Christianity, not that Christianity that is aligned itself with. Judaism, because when Allah says, لَن تَرْضَ أَنْكَ الْيَهُودُ وَلَنْ نَصَارَ حَتَّى تَتَّبِعَ مِلَّتَهُمْ The Jews and Christians will never be happy with you because they've become one milla. They be, this is, in essence, the Judeo-Christian civilization we find ourselves in today. But those Jews and those Christians who say, وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودُ لَيْسَتِ النَّصَارَ عَلَى شَيْءٍ That the Jews, they, they say the Christians have nothing. وَقَالَتِ النَّصَارَ لَيْسَتَ الْيَحُودُ عَلَى شيء. And the Nasara, they say, the Christians say the Jews have nothing. You see, these Orthodox Christians, they are they don't have that type of the Santa Claus Christianity type of alliance of, of where Judaism and Islam have merged into one oh, in, 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 in this area. But that Orthodox Christianity that you find in Abyssinia, that Orthodox Christianity which you find in Russia, that Orthodox Christianity which you find in Greece, from the time of the Ottomans, Muslims, leaders especially, have done things, unfortunately, to give Islam a very bad name. It's a curse word to say to another uh, Greek person, you're a Turk. It's like considered, a, so we didn't have this problem in the Umayyad and the Abbasid. We didn't have this problem in the lands the Sahaba went to. You can compare, for example, Salahuddin Ayyubi is a very good example, right? Compare it to Muhammad Fateh. Salahuddin Ayyubi had a very good relationship with his enemies. He had he 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 was a person of taqwa. He would go to the masjid and say, "Okay, we will be ready to fight when the masjids are full." He would be he would be concerned with the reading of Quran when they're the day, the night before they're going to the battlefield. There are narrations about people praying tahajjud. If you compare Salahuddin Ayyubi's character versus Muhammad Fatih and the and the and the and the and the, and the, uh, the, the people that came after him, the leaders that came after him then you will notice that there's, there was a big difference between like Salahuddin Ayyubi and the type of respect he earned even in the West versus what Muhammad Fatih did was essentially he, he fought with people that didn't want to fight him because he was obsessed with the idea of getting the Hagia Sophia. He was obsessed with not making peace even if they kept offering peace, right? And, and, and there's a whole history to this which I can go to later, but I also want to mention something that at least it could be considered that okay let's say i give you that uh, the ottomans were darul khilafa or they were darul islam okay according to the fiqhi books they were darul islam but turkey's not the modern day turkey when does the modern day turkey get to speak on behalf of muhammad fatih or when or when does after the treaty of uh, 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 sarev i think it's called sarev after the Treaty of Sarev, in which basically what happened, why was Hagia Sophia converted into a museum, is something goes like this, that the different empires, the French and the British and the Germans, they were going to like take the Ottomans away from the map. And, uh, and, 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 and you know, uh, Mustafa Kemal had been fighting them and then they, they didn't want to be involved in the Second World War. The Greeks tell uh, Mustafa uh, Kemal Ataturk, you know, okay, give us Hagia Sophia back because that's like their Kaaba for them. That's like the Vatican for them. That's their Vatican that we took away from them. And 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 yes, I do fear wars, as especially as these nation states become weir weaker and religion of identity, uh, which is a longer conversation I can have. But you know, it's kind of like we're Christians because we're not Muslim. Kind of like identity that's taking uh, this rise of this type of identity that's taking place in Europe. But uh, Mustafa Tur, uh, Kamal Atatur changed it to a museum because they wanted it. They wanted their church back. He knew he couldn't do that, so you know he changed it into a museum. 
the point I'm trying to make here, the question I'm raising, at least for discussion, is that why does Turkey get to speak on behalf of the Ottomans? Why not, and this is the point, why not give Hagia Sophia back to the Christians and make an alliance with those people that the Prophet told us are good for our alliance? Why not make an alliance with the people? The Quran points to us that they're good for an alliance. Those people who the Prophet says that they make monasteries, they have churches, and you know, till today, they have the old monks, they have the monks with the beards, okay? Till today, their women wear hijab, okay? Till today, they pray like the Muslim, they put their forehead on the ground. Those Christians that would be would be the closest to us, that, that if they see if they see a Muslim praying, they're like, oh, wow, this is how we pray. They see our women, they're like, oh, this is how we dress. We have uh, alienated that group of Christians away from us by doing this. And I think from a Maslaha perspective, that is far worse than the gain of converting this into a masjid. Could I just uh, add some points uh, on, on that issue? Um, I think uh, it's a mistake and it's incorrect to really think about Byzantine Empire or the Roman Empire or the Orthodox Roman Empire as somehow a potential alliance for the Muslims. I think it's a misreading of history uh, and it's su trying to superimpose Islamic eschatology, which means the prophecies of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi on today's uh, day and age. And rather, we should just look at the evidence from the reality, from the political analysis as it is. We know the expedition of Tabuk was initiated because the Roman Byzantines were trying to initiate war or removal of Medina uh, and therefore Islam from, uh, from the Hijaz. Yeah. And this time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We know that during the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu an, he sought an army out uh, against the Byzantines or the Romans. We know that Umar radiallahu an defeated them and took over the cities and Bilad al-Sham and Jerusalem and also the Coptic Christians. Uh, we also know that in the 11th century, Alex Alexia, Emperor Alexius I, he wrote a letter to Pope Urban II extolling him to send him troops and armies. We also know that in the when the first crusade took place, he supplied them with weapons, he supplied them with money uh, and arms. We also know that he, they were supply uh, half uh, the regiment was commanded by a Byzantine emperor, uh, Byzantine general. Uh, we know that the Russians, when they adopted Orthodox Christianity, they uh, undertook massacres against the Muslims. For example, the Khanate uh, of Kazan was conquered by the troops of uh, Ivan the Terrible. And this was in the 1550s. And he banned the mosques and he undertook forced conversions uh, of Muslims uh, into Christians. And Muhammad al Fatih never did this. He never uh, forced people to become Christians. And in fact, he permitted uh, um, churches to still exist within Constantinople. Sheikh al Islam, Ali Afendi, who is a Sheikh al Islam around about the end of the 15th, early 16th century, explains in terms of a fatwa why churches were still permissible in Constantinople. And he said because there was secret agreement made by the patriarchs with Sultan Muhammad al Fatih that they would preserve certain churches. And that's why some people argue and discuss that actually this is where the debate and discussion about the purchasing of Hagia Sophia took place. But the point being is, is that Ali uh, Effendi, Sheikh al Islam Ali Effendi, he mentions the point that they permitted these churches to exist. Now, imagine that and compare that to, uh, you know, Elizabeth of Russia who launched a campaign of forced conversions of Russians to not, of non-Orthodox subjects, which included both Muslims and Jews. Or we could talk about the Greek revolutions and the massacres between 1821 uh, and to 1923, uh, uh, which they say up to three million Muslims were either killed or forced into exile, many of whom also died on the road in, uh, you know, in refugee camps of starvation and disease. Uh, so we can go back in history pre-Ottoman period time, or we can go post-Ottoman period time, there has been numerous wars, actions uh, undertaken uh, by Orthodox Christians. Now, we, obviously, we don't demonize all Orthodox Christians. That's not our position, obviously not. But the point being is that we have to analyze it from a political perspective and not try to superimpose prophecies onto the political reality of Russia today, as an example, and claim Russia today is 
the Byzantine Empire. Russia today is not Byzantine Empire. It's not been the Byzantine Empire uh, ever. It adopted Orthodox Christianity. But even during the Soviet period, when they were bombing and invading Afghanistan and other areas, they were doing so because of their political ideology of communism. In the same way that the reason why they invade and attack uh, Syria today is not because of, you know, um, any antagonism they've had with the Ottomans in the past. It's because it's within their national capital or national interest, secular interest of today. And so we have to be really clear um, so we don't get into this um, misunderstanding that this is somehow, uh, you know, broken ties with Orthodox Christians or these nation states which claim to be Orthodox Christians. Uh, that's incorrect. And... That's a wrong reading of history, in, in my opinion. Yeah, I want to respond to that, if you don't mind. Bismillah. So, um, yes, so the Prophet, like I mentioned myself, that uh, the Prophet initiated the Battle of Tabuk with the, uh, in this case, if you want to talk specifically about Orthodox Christians. So there are plenty of instances where the Orthodox Christians did bad to the Muslims. And there are letters that we have published in our in our in some of our books, uh, you know, where Omar is saying, I have information that they're doing this against us and they want to extinguish the light of Allah. And Omar even go, goes to the point of writing letters where he calls Hercules a dog because of the types of things that they were planning against Islam. So this, and the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that they will fight with you till the day of judgment, meaning the Christians in general, right? But I want you to make a distinction here about something. And that is that the ayah that I was referring to uh, mentions two aspects. And that is that you will find two groups being very hard against you. And in the Sigha, in this, in the Arabic, Tajidanna is in the present future. Okay. And then the same word, Tajidanna, you will find, meaning you will find at a certain point in history. Yes. So there is an eschatology aspect to that, but it's not without any basis. Now, so yes, Christians have been against us. Russia has been against us. I, I, I can see that. But the thing is, is that the Quran tells us that to make an alliance with this group of people, the Christians. And so I don't see what we, what do we, in terms of maslaha, in terms of maslaha, do I lose more by converting a, a museum into a masjid? Or do I lose more in terms of political currency internationally by doing something like this? In a time where Muslims are really, because I think, uh, let me just open up the debate a little bit more. I think that, you know, it's basically a setup that this was exactly what was going to happen. And the reaction we got from the Muslim world is exactly what was, what happened is what we did as a reaction is what was expected, which was that we would be happy over this. And this setup is okay. Now that you did this, then don't say anything if we do it. And you know, Israel right now at this time is actively, actively moving to annex the, the foreign minister of Palestine just said that they're, they're, now these, fi these final annexations are to get Masjid Aqsa. In a time like this, to make a move like this, where we, we disconnect ourselves from potential allies because we don't have the political currency to do it, and then those that pro may have, uh, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're secluding ourselves from them at a time. The Maslaha, so the, basically, in terms of fiqh awliyat, fiqh priorities, is Masjid Aqsa comes more is more important than Hagia Sophia. And we're putting Masjid Aqsa in jeopardy because we want to be happy over. And I get your point. So I get your point that this is a big change in Turkey. But yet it's not a big change in Turkey. Because if you talk to the Turkish people, if you talk to the Islamists that are put in jail and put in prison for their Islamic ideas, uh, those people that are critical of Erdogan and he puts them in jails. And these are good Muslims that he's putting in jail and punishing as we speak. I'm talking about hundreds of families that I know in the U.S. here that ha that can't go. I know hundreds of Muslim Turkish families that can't go to Turkey because of the dictatorship. Erdogan is nothing more than a dictator. No different than the Arabs. It's 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 just... Uh, it's if you if you sit down with the Turkish people that are religious and if you talk to them a lot, you will see that there's no difference between what Erdogan is doing and what uh, what the Arab dictators are doing. And in a situation like this, he's only put fire into something that was already a bad situation. And, 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 and now 
if you read the, the, the newspapers of Israel, you know, Israel was the first, like one of the major, the, the, you know, the very famous Aretz, is it called? The, their newspaper that's very popular. The first, they put it on the front page, you know, that, that, uh, that Turkey did this. And what's interesting in all of this is that what does Erdogan say after doing this? He says, next we will get Al-Aqsa because he knows, he knows that he put Al-Aqsa in jeopardy. Why can, we... can I just uh, just really quickly? Could I just ask? Uh, first, I agree with you that Erdog this shouldn't be seen as Hagia Sophia turning into a mosque as a support for Erdogan. They are two separate issues, uh, and that's why we talk about the sentiments of the Muslim public and its leadership is, is separate. But I want you to ask a question: Who should the Muslims today be seeking alliance with? Which political powers do you think the Muslims should be seeking alliance with? If you look at the Quran, right? The Quran tells us who not to seek alliances with. And the Quran doesn't really tell us much about who to seek alliances with. Meaning Quran tells us don't seek alliances with these groups. Meaning leaving it open with who you can seek alliances with. The Prophet made alliances with Quraysh, for example. The Prophet made alliances with the Jews. The Prophet made alliances. But the specific group that stopped in the Quran, like, like unequivocally, Quran says do not, is those people that say, Hudan aw nasara tahtadu. Be Jew or Christian, you'll be guided. It is the it is the it is the coming together of Judeo Christian as one, which is basically Protestant Christianity, because they did away with their Pope. They had the Bible, and you know what's funny is the same ayah that I was referring to, where Allah mocks them, because the, when the Jews say, "Oh, Christians have nothing," and the Christians say the Jews have nothing, then Allah says, "Wahum yatlun al kitab." They're reading the same book, right? Meaning the, the Old Testament is the same book that they both read and they both say they have nothing. They have no basis for each other, but yet they read the same book. Even though they're reading the same book, the group that the Quran unequivocally tells us do not become make partners with is this group. It's the Judeo-Christian alliance. Other than that, you're open to make alliances with any group looking at the Maslaha. But... There is an indication in the ayah that I referred to that you will find them humble. La Allah says they, they're not they're not prideful, and you will find them Allah. And the, Allah's words are true. You will find them the closest to you. It's not only Russia though. Keep that in mind. It could be Greece. It could be the Abyssin Abyssinian Christians. Abyssinian Muslims and Christians have a great relationship till today. It can be Muslims in Eritrea. It could be Muslims in in any of these African countries that are all Orthodox Christians where the Prophet told his companions to go. So, and, and I, I do uh, feel that in the future that uh, there, will, there might be some sort of a positive alliance between Christians and Muslims in, in Africa, the, the region of Africa specifically. But yet, in terms of the, the priorities of the Muslims, uh, why would we shoot ourselves in the foot by doing something like this? Why? The timing is off. The timing, you know, it's not just that you did it. If we had done this 30 years ago, maybe I can see, okay, we did it, you know. But the timing at a time where coronavirus is out, all the countries are concerned about themselves, at a time where Israel is, is actively annexing parts of, 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 of the West Bank and Gaza to itself, it's actively getting ready to do that. Election uh, in the U.S. is just coming about, which means things are being negotiated that if Trump you want to win, then you have to do X, Y, Z, right? At, at, at a time like this, to do something like this, I think is, is, it is a, a, a desperate move and, and, and a very uh, a, a move that doesn't have a lot of political insight at all. The reason why I ask the question, which political powers? Because obviously what tends to happen is that this becomes a discussion about Russia uh, primarily uh, and other countries like Greece. No, I'm not, about, I'm, I'm uh, not uh, limiting the ayah to Russia. I'm no, not. no, I know, but I'm just saying so there are people who do uh, not limit it to Russia, but they do talk about Russia as being the future Byzantine Empire. I think there is a danger when we look at the problems within the Muslim world and we think that what is the solution is the alliance with non-Muslims uh, who have an agenda and who have their own political interests. Whether they are Christian, whether they are Orthodox Christian, whether they are secular, capitalist, or communist. I know, but then the question is, why does Quran say make uh, alliances with them? You'll find no, them I, 
There's a reason yeah, for you, that, you, right? It's, yeah, it says you find, and then obviously we'd have to look at the tafsir of that Quran, uh, ayah of Quran. But but no, no. But what I'm saying is the Sheikh Omar is this: is first and foremost, you have to study the reality. You can't just simply say, okay, this verse of Quran says this about the Christians. Therefore, mm -hmm. let's superimpose it upon the current reality. What we have to do is look and study the reality as it is, and then we can go to the Quran and look at these uh, rulings. For example, okay, Russia. So as an example of in Russia, 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 right? In, if, if just, Russia, if in this world that point, we live in, you're speaking over each other now. Sorry. <laughs> so I just yeah, wanted I'm to fine. make this final point, just the final point. Sergei Lavrov, he was the foreign minister of Russia, yeah, and in 30th of September 2015, he argued in front of the State uh, Security Council of the United Nations and he talked about the joint and coordinated efforts. And he said the joint and coordinated efforts in Syria with America and whoever you want to say the Christian Jewish Alliance or whoever it is. He said it is in order to prevent the creation of a extremist caliphate. Yeah, I a caliphate because he perceives it extremist. So I'm saying is that there is a misunderstanding sometimes where we try to superimpose the ayat of Quran upon the reality as opposed to study the reality and then go to the Quran and the Sunnah mm -hmm. and apply the correct hukum for it. If yeah, that, and that's if the that, danger, happening, yeah. that would be wrong. But let me let me put it to you the other way, okay? Which is that this reality never existed of the Judeo Christian uh coming together that's mentioned in Quran. Meaning never existed throughout the, the entire Islamic history. The, the, the Christians always oppressed the Jews, right? Until Israel came into existence and Israel then built its alliances with the West. And it is only during this time period that you find a Judeo-Christian civilization come into existence. Before that, it did not exist. So there is a clear prohibition in the Quran of who not to make an alliance within this time because this situation that the Quran is talking about did not exist except today. Okay, except in the days of today. I'm not trying to superimpose my interpretation upon the reality, but this is the reality that then you can see the ayah fits into the reality. Having said that, when the Quran says this, that don't make alliances with Christians and Jews, now, let's go to the other ayah. When Allah says, you will definitely find that, the, today what do you find? Israel and India. Okay, These are the two countries that are that have a great relationship, that are vying to, the, you know, we have Kashmir in one place in which they're using the tactics that are, were on Palestine, on Kashmir. They have, a, they, have, they have a lot in common in that sense, uh, in the sense of, just even from a religious perspective, from coming from the Brahman down to the to the Shudi, to the to the untouchable, this kind of like pyramid scheme of human beings. You have the chosen people, and then the others after that. You know, the chosen people, the Goyim, and then you have very similar. You have a lot of sim the point I'm trying to make here is that never in history did you find these two groups working against Islam and Muslims as they are today, at least in in my seeing the world. And so, therefore, at, when you see that time where Jews and the Mushrikeen, meaning India and, and whoever else, when you see them working against Islam, then, the, then Allah is telling you who you can find alliances with at that time. Are the Zionists and the Orthodox Christians of Russia in alliance today? The Zionists in what? And the Orthodox okay. Christians of Russia, are they in alliance today? To the Greeks no, and no. the Israelis. The, the Orthodox Christians, one of the one of the, the interesting things I found is that they are not they're very anti-Zionist. In fact, there are articles and, and, and journals <clears throat> about how to do away with anti-Semitism within the Orthodox Christianity. From my understanding, uh, there is a strong political relationship between Russia. So Israel. If that, and that has is been true, that for a if long that is time. true, then the rule is that whoever makes an alliance between Christianity and Judaism would be dismissed. No, but this is what I'm saying. The reason why I'm saying this is because I'm, I'm trying to work out uh, that some people have said, I'm not saying yourself, yourself, Sheikh Omar, but some people have said that we need to, you know, appease the Orthodox Christians primarily in Russia because mm -hmm. we need to, you know, not be isolated in the world arena. And therefore, this action isolates us. And I'm saying that, look, when you actually apply this to the current political reality, what you find is, is that the, the, 
various nations, whether that's Russia, Greece, you know, in the Orthodox Christian nations, or France and Britain and America, or Israel or India, they have designs against the Muslims, and they are trying to ensure that the Muslim Ummah doesn't become unified and therefore become and rise as a power. The mistake, therefore, would be is the that ayah Muslims... that, that I read, you know, in, in terms of Asbab and Nuzul, had to do with Ethiopia, right? So I would look starting from there, and then look starting from who is most similar to the people of Ethiopia, meaning the Christianity in Ethiopia. Okay, and so that's that's how I would basically. Okay. Ethiopia uh, is also Orthodox Christianity. Uh, okay, here, so I want to bring this is, conversation. Orthodox Christians in Ethiopia are they upset about uh, what what happened with Hagia Sophia? And the answer is yes, of course they are. Okay, Sheikh Omar, I, I, I want to cross. Go. Well, Sorry. Uh, I, I want to bring this conversation back in because I think we're now going to talk about, you know, which Christians are friends and which ones aren't, which ones we need to lie with and so forth. Uh, and it's kind of going to move away from uh, the topic. But Sharif, what I want to pose to you is, can you not understand the sentiments and the hurt that Christian uh, friends of yours would feel in having their church and not any old church but a symbolic church of this being converted into a masjid this is like you know in a this is equivalent to like say the muslims capturing the vatican and converting that to the church for the catholics or say from a muslim perspective if the christians have somehow conquered medina and convert masjid and nabui into a church just because they had the power to do so uh could you not understand why people would be offended and hurt by this and why this in that context is not a wise move to make because you're you know breaking relationships potentially pushing people away further from islam showing that we're all about you know war and control and power forced by power that kind of thing you, yeah no it's a good question I, I think uh, firstly i've in not fact, i was saying we're falling into the setup that was kind of like was actually in my mind so thank you for yeah. saying that yes so my point is this, is that I work with many Christians uh, uh, and non-Muslims and not one has ever come up. They, you know, they, they will ask me loads of questions about Islam, Muslims or whatever's happening in the media at that moment in time. No one has actually come up to me and said, oh, you guys have turned Hagia Sophia back into a, uh, into a mosque. Because to be quite frank, Hagia Sophia, in terms of being an influential church, stops its influence at the end of the Roman Empire because it was because of the Roman Empire it had its influence. It was a social political institution of the Roman Empire. It wasn't a social political institution necessary for Orthodox Christianity. Like, for example, in our Sharia, in our Islam, the Kaaba and Medina and Masjid al-Aqsa are something established within the Islamic text. Yeah. So, irrespective when it, you know uh, the Orthodox Christians supported the Crusaders to take. Uh, Masjid al-Aqsa and convert it into a church and put a cross upon Masjid al-Aqsa. So irrespective of what happens then, it will always be sanctified by the Muslims because the Quran sanctifies it and because of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we need to understand that there is a very much difference between Hagia Sophia as a social, political, cultural uh, relic of the past of the Roman Empire uh, to how essential it is for the faith of many Christians. It is not seen as essential for the faith of many Christians, uh, as the Kaaba would be, as Medina would be, as Masjid al-Aqsa would be. However, I can understand this, that if a Christian does feel like, oh, hold on, why are you uh, converting it back to uh, a, a mosque? Um, you know, I would explain to them, and I would explain to them that, look, you know, uh, various examples of this. Firstly, I would probably say that, look, how come you weren't concerned about it being converted into a museum? How come there has been discussions of, you know, there's never been any discussions about converting the Masjid of Cordoba back into a mosque or the Masjid of Seville, yeah, or the 369 masjids in Greek Orthodox and Albanian uh, and Orthodox lands that were converted into a mosque. So why is it now suddenly there is a discussion? And to be quite frank, and let's be honest about this, I live in the UK, so it's maybe slightly different other places. But to be quite honest, many people are not that interested in churches. Where I work, next door is a church that just a few years ago got turned into a pub. Yeah, it was abandoned. Okay. And there are many other churches that so, have been abandoned. So, so they're not so that, it's not emotional for them. 
Okay, I, I just want to bring uh, Sheikh Baloch back in to, to respond into that because yeah. we've been streaming for about one and a half hours so far. So okay. uh, I don't want it to go on too long. So okay. uh, Sheikh Baloch, you, you live in America, which is like seen as, you know, the Bible belt of Christianity right now. So you probably have a different perspective. So if you could just give your remarks on that and then we could go into our closing comments, inshallah. Sure, inshallah. Um, see, what is happening in the world political stage is that we're all moving towards the right. Whether it is Modi in India, whether it's Netanyahu in Israel, whether it is Trump, uh, I think the guy that got elected in your area, what is his name, Boris Johnson, something. So, you know, the world is moving to the right. What does that mean, that the whole world is moving to the right? It means even if I'm an atheist, okay? It means even if I'm an atheist, I still want the Christian civilization, and I don't want to be invaded by others. You see, the things are moving in this direction. Now it is a requirement in Germany to put a cross in every single government building. It is a requirement now in every single, the elections that are being won now, the parties that are these new parties that are, that are coming about in Europe, like in France, they're all their platforms, the ones here in the US, the Tea Party or the Republican Party, those parties that are winning, whether it is Modi in India, whether it is uh, Netanyahu in Israel, all these parties, they have one thing in common. Their platform is anti-Islam. And they have, they're creating their own identity by what they are not. In other words, their, their, their Christian piety is not about, let's be, you know, like I'll give you an example, like France, one of the political parties in France was promoting itself with a, these, a picture of women in the beach saying, not burqas, right? Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, but with bikinis, the point being that we, we, peop, the Western intellectuals are scared about a few things. Number one, they're scared about the change of demographics. Number two, and this is very similar to what happened with Fir'aun, because you have Bani Israel that was becoming very large in population. So they were killing off their children every other year, the men, right? And, and letting the women live. And then Fir'aun, the Kipti tribe was very small in comparison to Bani Israel. They had to, they had to do something about this, you know, size of the minority becoming the majority. And this is this is the phenomenon that we're going through right now. Is that there is a reaction to Muslims in particular and and change in general of the demographics, right? I think like every uh, nine out of ten babies born in France are like Muslim. Like, it's not just that we're in France or Britain, it's the number of kids we're producing. And, 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 and so there's this kind of like reaction to all of this that's not necessarily a religious reaction, but it's under the guise of religiousity. It's under the guise of because we don't like Muslims and we are Christians. And even atheists are saying, be, even though I don't believe in God, but I still want my, you know, I want my civilization. I want the Christian civilization. And so there is a going to be a reaction to that. Now, the, 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 uh, there are can people, I just ask you to come to the end of this point so we could go yeah, on to the closing statement? There are Christians who feel, who have said, who are on record of saying that we are being slapped in our faces every single day. Muslims pray in Al-Aqsa and every single day Muslims pray in Hagia Sophia. Okay, thank you for that. So, um, if we just go to say our closing remarks, because I don't want to take this on. I mean, what I'd like to say so far is, Alhamdulillah, whilst we have people of different perspectives, it shows how we as Muslims can have a civilized com conversation without the need to insult and take mockery out of each other. And if if any, if our listeners take anything away, regardless of the points being discussed on the particular issue, it's this is how I believe you know people can come together with differing opinions and perspectives mm -hmm. and rationally and calmly and in a uh, fruitful manner discuss discuss our issues. So with that, uh, I will I'll ask Sherry for his first set of closing remarks, and then we'll move on to Sheikh Omar for his closing remarks. So, uh, is, Sharif, it, is this you... my final point? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. No, alhamdulillah, I think I've enjoyed today's discussion. I think there's so much. I think these are the types of discussions that can go on for hours and hours uh, regardless, at a time. I think my my initial point was this, was was Sultan Muhammad al fatihs original decision to convert a social, religious, political institute of the Roman Empire 
where the coronation of Roman emperors took place, which had, you know, uh, political significance for that, was it justified in order to convert it? One, it's justified in terms of the fiqh, and two, it was justified in the masla of the Muslims at that time. This is, you know, and the problem is, is that we live in the 21st century, 500 years uh, you know, uh, away from that period of time, and we try and superimpose our own, you know, worldviews upon that, uh, and particular readings upon that situation. Then, um, you know, and so we we have to be aware of this. The second thing, so I think that's pretty clear, and I think even Sheikh Omar accepts those ikhtilaf upon this issue, even though he might not say it's a particularly wise uh, position. The second issue is regards to okay, why is there a reaction in the West? Why is UNESCO, United Nations, America, Britain, and some other places, why have they come out in criticism? Why has the Pope come out in criticism when the Pope excommunicated Orthodox Christianity? They believe the Orthodox Christians, they made takfir upon them. Yeah, they believe that when they went in the Fourth Crusade in 1204, they ransacked the city, destroyed uh, many of the churches, they took many of the relics, you know, damage Hagia Sophia and then converted it into a... Why are they so concerned about this? Yeah, what's the discussion? And we have to be very careful. The issue is not about uh, offending the sensibilities of Christians in Europe. Yeah, or I, I don't even think it's about offending the sensibilities of Christians in Russia or Greece, per se. No doubt there may be some Christians who feel, oh, you know what? You know, it would be nice if it was returned back to a church although there is only 0.2% of a Christian population now that resides in Turkey. The fact remains is this, the reason why there's been criticism is because of the shift in mentality that's existing in the Muslim world. How this is now seen as being perceived as the Islamization or building, making Islam more central within the Muslim world. This is not the end. This is not the, yani, you know, we've succeeded now, we've defeated kufr and secularism. No, of course not. But it demonstrates a particular sentiment, and the reaction to this demonstrates that also that sentiment as well. So this is the second point. The third issue is this: is is that you know we have to be uh, clear how we approach the Islamic text, particularly the text of prophecies. We shouldn't use the prophecies to superimpose upon our reality and then extract the rulings. Rather, we should study the reality and then go to the Islamic text regards to that. So we take Russia, we take Greece, we take Abyssinia or Ethiopia as they are in the political reality today and not to try to superimpose what we want them to be uh, from what we our particular readings of the Islamic text are. The final point that I want to mention is, is that you know, there's a lot of um, demonization of, uh, you know, uh, the Ottoman Khilafah, or later on became known as the Ottoman Khilafah or Ottoman Sultanate. And we have to be very careful of this because there's a lot of retrospective readings that have gone on through the Orientalists uh, because they were scared. They were scared of the Ottoman Khilafah because of its uh, dominance within the region and its expansion. But, you know, just to quote very quickly, and this is a famous agreement that was made and in fact, this agreement still can be found in the monasteries in the Balkans as well. It was uh, known as Ahad Nami, Nama. Uh, and it states as follows. This is what Muhammad al-Fati said. He said, nobody should create obstacles and difficulties to them, the monks and their churches. They should live without worries in our land. Those who are running away and leaving will be granted security and protection to live without fear in our land. They should settle in their churches and no one should annoy them, neither my excellency, nor any of my viziers, servants, uh, ra'ya, uh, and people of our land. No one should attack and injure them, their lives, property, and churches. In addition, they should not be permitted to bring man from foreign parts into my uh, lands of my domain. Here, Muhammad al-Fati is mentioning how he's given a covenant and he didn't just give it to the orthodox christians by the way he also gave it to the catholic uh, christians too uh in order to protect and safeguard their ability to practice their religion the decision that sultan muhammad al fati made was a political decision when it came to hagia sophia it wasn't to wipe out christianity from the region and we know this also because in constantinople he permitted the maintenance of certain churches and in fact he encouraged christians to come back 
to Constantinople, which had a population of about 16,000, 17,000. And then within 50 years of Othmanic uh, rule, it became one of the most populous uh, cities in the entire world and it regained its splendor uh, again. So, you know, we have to be any you know, balanced and fair. Thank you, Richard. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Richard. No. Sorry to cut you off. We're just trying to keep in time. So, uh, Sheikh Umar, if you could have your final five minutes, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa ahlul uqdata min lisani yafqahu qawli amin ya Rabbi. Allah says in the Quran, la tusubbu al-ladhina don't curse the gods of other because they will end up cursing your god what happened uh, 600 years ago in the time of muhammad fatih he did things according to his situation his political circumstances i understand that the situation that we're in today the situation muslims are in today uh, is very much like if you remember the time where the Arab Spring was happening. And uh, many Muslims felt that the Arab Spring is like the best thing that has ever happened to us. And uh, it was another setup, you can say. And uh, Muslims rose and the end result was they got rid of Gaddafi. They got rid of the leaders they wanted to get rid of and they tightened up in areas where they wanted to tighten it up and uh, then it, it in the end of the day the net was negative for the muslims okay they killed good people uh, like the president of egypt who at least wanted to bring islam there and uh, then you have the whole mess that happened in syria as a result of this uh, arab spring okay then uh, so, so th that was a setup in which good Muslims gave their lives, they gave their emotions, they gave their time, they gave their money. Many great Muslims that that I know that were, you know, um, that were somewhere are in jail even till today in Egypt. Okay. This is a very similar situation in my mind to that, where uh, we have basically done something that uh, we think is good but we have basically slapped uh, people emotionally at the very least. Uh, we have cursed their God at the very least. And uh, it will. every cause has an effect. Every cause has an effect. And so in my feeling and uh, looking at where the type of hatred that is increasing day by day, uh, that this will come with its consequences. This will not go unanswered. And this is exactly what they want. They wanted the whole Muslim to say, this is a great thing. They wanted the whole Ummah to say, we're happy to have a masjid back because this is, you know, uh, to put it bluntly, giving them the middle finger, right? It's our revenge. But I think that the consequences of this will be very negative. And uh, you see, if it was just a matter of, just if you look at it, even from the character of the Prophet, it's not Ihsan to do something like this. It's not Ihsan. It's not the beautiful character of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's not, it's not the character of, of, of showing generosity and, and having uh, this obligation that if you're a Muslim, then you owe to show people the best face of Islam. This was just a very, you can say, a legal face of Islam and a very uh, dry face of Islam. And uh, we will feel good. Uh, and inshallah, there will be no consequences, but I fear uh, that we have just set ourselves up for uh, some very negative uh, situation. Can I just mention one final point really yeah. quickly? Yeah, sorry. I don't see this as a middle finger reverting it, uh, Hagia Sophia, back into a mosque from a museum. I don't see it as a middle finger to the West or to even the Christians at all. This was a criticism or this was a... a, a a reversal, uh, if you want to, I don't like using the word middle finger, but this is basically putting two fingers up at Kamal Ataturk and the Kamalist agenda. I think that's how a lot of Muslims in Turkey see it. They don't see it as we're trying to offend Christians or we're right. trying to hurt If we change the banking yeah. system, it wouldn't have the same emotional effect on East, either us or them. But because we're, we're, we're leaving everything intact, but the one thing that is emotional on both sides. 
That's what we want. No, That's no, what but I, yeah, but I understand that. But I'm just saying, just just so that you're we're, we're clear and the audience is clear that it this doesn't wasn't matter seen, what I feel. It, it matters what they feel. The, no, no, but this is the point. Point also, it matters what the intention was. So the intention was not to say we're going to offend Christians by doing this. The intention was was that look, uh, this is about reversing Kamal Ataturk's trend of the of the aggressive secularization of the Muslim world, particularly Turkey, and therefore it was in that perspective. But Sheikh Umar, I agree with you that really the real change that has to take place in Turkey is a comprehensive change, a systemic change, changing the banking system and the economic system and the ruling system, bringing back Sharia. Uh, yeah, one place we can agree on is the Khilaf, I think, right? Yeah, We both want the, Khilaf and yeah. Khilaf. So um, the, the last thing that, uh, that, if you don't mind, I want to end by yeah, something so, interesting. Say question, for everyone, the last is that why did Ibrahim break the idols and the Prophet didn't in Mecca? You see, Ibrahim had the chance, he broke the idols. But the Prophet was in Mecca for 10 years. He prayed in Mecca. He prayed towards the Kaaba. He didn't break any idols. And the reason is because timing of things is important. And when you have a jama'at, when you have a collective, because Ibrahim was alone. You know, he was a fatah. He was like a young man. And he was willing to do what he, he was. He didn't have anybody responsible but for himself. He broke the idols. But the Prophet didn't allow even the Sahaba, Sahaba to break the idols. He didn't allow them to even fight back. Kufu aidiyakum, keep your hands tied. In, in the Makki period, there was wisdom in why he, did, he waited. That when he had strength, he came from a point of strength and then he broke the idols. If, you, if the Prophet broke the idols in Makkah when he was weak, then the Muslims would have suffered the consequences of that. So that, I just wanted to leave that for thought. Okay, so Jazakallah khair for both of our guests today for uh, contributing and inshallah I'm sure that this will lead to much thought and you know I hope this was a fruitful discussion from both of you and apologies from my side if I had to cut anyone up or ask any awkward questions. No, but, I, jazakallah I, I gained a lot of respect for our brother and inshallah maybe we can continue to talk on what's inshallah. happening. Yeah, inshallah we can, we can discuss Wednesday now things and maybe, who knows, maybe a future uh, more concise or a particular aspect of this can be discussed further in our programs. Yeah. But Jazakallah khair for joining and Jazakallah khair for the viewers at home for watching. Uh, please like and share this video um, so other people can benefit. Absolutely. Jazakallah. Okay, thank you so much. Jazakallah khair.